Hey everybody, in this video I'm going to be showing you how to calculate the seismic force on a structure's diaphragm. This example problem falls under section 3, seismic forces for building structures of the board's test plan. So let's get started. First off, what's a diaphragm? What's a cord? What's a collector? Well, simply put, simply put, a diaphragm is a horizontal element that takes seismic force generated in your structure and transfers that through in-plane shear to your lateral force resisting system, whether that be a moment frame or shear walls or brace frames, etc. Uh, in this case, for this problem, we're presented with uh, some diaphragm force. We've got a flexible diaphragm that's transferring load to special reinforced concrete shear walls. And it's doing so with the help of a couple collectors, 60 foot in length on either side that I'm gonna go ahead and highlight here, okay? So a diaphragm, it can bend in plane. And what that looks like is, I'm gonna go ahead and just draw it in orange here. When the load is generated in the diaphragm, for a flexible diaphragm, it's gonna cause it to bend in plane just like so, right? Kind of like a deep beam. And when that happens, you're gonna expect just like a deep beam or just like a beam uh, to have some compression uh, in the top there, right? And then some tension there in the bottom. And so typically you're gonna to wanna to be checking that perimeter element or designing a perimeter element specifically to take that axial load. Okay, and so this problem is asking us to find what that maximum force is, and the force appears in the cord element. So just like that top element you have in a truss that's seeing either compression on the top or tension on the bottom of that truss um, as the truss spans over some length, uh, you're going to have a cord element at the top and the bottom of your diaphragm, if you will. So this problem is asking us, to find that maximum cord force along the north-south edges. So the, the top here and the bottom here as I've drawn, drawn it out. And then also to find the diaphragm shear force, right? So we're given the force uh, F sub PX in the north-south direction, and it's asking us to find the diaphragm shear force. And drawn in red, that diaphragm shear force is gonna act along the edges here. It's gonna transfer that load to the lateral force resisting system, as we said, that is special reinforced concrete shear walls, okay? All right, so we've covered two of the three that I mentioned. I mentioned diaphragms, cords, and collectors, okay? We covered diaphragms, we covered cords, and now we're gonna talk about collectors. So what is a collector? A collector, um, it's exactly what it sounds like it is, right? It collects load from the diaphragm, it brings it back to the lateral force resisting system, and so you can see that we've got two collectors here on either side, they're both gonna be working to transfer load back to the lateral force resistant system. And if you think about these collectors in terms of their boundary conditions, you've got these concrete shear walls at the top and at the bottom of them. Uh, you can think of them almost like restraints. Think of if you had a beam and an axial load running across that beam, okay? You're gonna have tension on one end and compression on the other end. As that load is pulling on that beam, and as you've got a restraint on one end, and uh, or a, a restraint on both ends, I should say, and then reactions at both ends, right? So uh, we'll see in a second here how taking that shear force and that shear force being applied to the collector element is gonna result in change in the load in that element uh, going from a tension uh, to a compression. Okay, so uh, we've got the diaphragm force of 10 kips, and we're just gonna jump into solving this problem here. Uh, diaphragm force of 10 kips, it's found typically, specifically F sub PX, it's gonna be found through the methodology uh, labeled out in ASCE 716 section 1210 on diaphragms, cords, and collectors, right? And so uh, this problem is set up such that somebody would have already found that load, F sub PX, 
And now we're going to take that and we're going to use it to calculate the maximum chord force. OK, so the way we find the maximum chord force, as I said, is we're taking that in plane bending as we drew in the orange just then. And we're using that and we're going to resolve that in plane bending into some tension and compression. So how do we quantify that in plane bending? Well, we quantify bending through moment, of course. So what is the maximum moment? Well, we've got a point load here. OK, and how are we going to find the maximum moment on a beam? Uh, with a given point load? Well, it's just a commonly known moment equation. Uh, moment, the maximum moment on a simply supported beam with a point load in the center. It's going to be m max is equal to PL over 4, right? Here, L is uh, 180 and P is 10 kips, right? So I'm going to go ahead and calculate here uh, m max is equal to 10 kips times 180 foot and that's going to be divided by 4 pl over 4 and so that load is going to result uh, or that moment is going to result to be 450 kip foot Okay, so we've got the moment. Now, how are we going to take that moment and convert it into a tension and a compression? Well, it's just about the couple, right? Th same as you would do with um, a moment couple, any moment couple you have. You've got a, a moment about a certain point. You can resolve it based off of that depth. In this case, the, the depth of the diaphragm is 160 feet. It's 50 plus 60 plus 50. And uh, you can go ahead and calculate your tension, which is going to be on the bottom of your diaphragm, your compression at the top, that couple, you're going to calculate it like so. Tension and compression is equal to 450 kip foot divided by 160 feet. OK. And so that's going to give us what? That's going to give us 2.8 kips. Okay. All right. So we've got the maximum chord force in uh, tension and in compression. Okay. Now there's one thing that we haven't done though yet. Okay. That force, it needs to be multiplied by some overstrength factor as specified by section 1210 of code. The overstrength factor being omega. OK, and specifically for special reinforced uh, concrete shear walls, you can look into the code and you're going to find that the overstrength factor is going to be 2.5. OK, so if we re if, if we want to uh, actually calculate what this is in terms of what we're going to be using for design, because this is seismic design category D, we're going to be required to multiply that by the overstrength factor. So just going to back up here. I'm just going to go ahead and multiply that by 2.5. OK, so 2.5 times uh, what we had there, which was a 2.8. And that's seven kips. Seven kips is our design force. And just a reminder, this is our overstrength factor. OK, next up, what's the diaphragm shear? That's V sub D, diaphragm shear. As we said, the diaphragm shear is what's going to be running along each side of the diaphragm. The shear that runs along each side of the diaphragm transfers the load to the lateral force resisting system, drawing it just once again there. Um, and so how do we calculate that? Well, we know what our diaphragm force is, is F PX is equal to 10 kips, right? And that's running along both sides. So if we divide that by two and we divide that by the length, uh, of the diaphragm, or the in this case, you could say the depth of the diaphragm, if you will, 160 feet, uh, we're going to come up with the diaphragm shear. Okay, so it's just V sub D is going to be equal to that 10 kips there. And if you just go ahead and divide that two, ta two times 160 foot. And remember, the two is because it goes to either side where we have our lateral force resisting system elements, the walls in this case. So 10 divided by two and then divided by the length, 160. And we're going to give that uh, response in pounds per linear foot. OK, 
So that comes out to 31.25 PLF. Now notice I did that conversion from KIPS to PLF in, in my head just there, right? So um, next, we're going to look at calculating the collector force, right? So as I said, the collector force is what's going to it's going to come up. It's a, it's a maximum force that's going to occur in these elements on the sides over here. Their collector elements are going to transfer the loads back to the shear walls. Okay. All right. What are we doing? So uh, if you try to think about what exactly is happening here, the load gets transferred back to the shear walls. The shear walls are really taking all of this lateral load. And so you have some uh, shear uh, resistance in the opposite direction and that's V sub wall if you will okay so what we can do here is if we go ahead and we calculate based off the load that's being taken uh, by the shear walls uh, and the difference from that to the diaphragm shear calling that the net force along this uh, wall line, we can visualize where exactly the maximum force in the collector is going to occur. Now, just to make that clear here, I'm going to draw in pink. <clears throat> wall is going to be taking, uh, obviously at the end, uh, visualizing the force, it's going to be zero force at the end here. But visualizing the load along the wall, we're going to come up here to a certain peak, right? Because obviously V wall is gonna be greater than VD. So we're gonna come up to a peak here. And then that peak is gonna quickly come back down to another peak on the either end, on the, uh, on the other side over here, as we consider the force V sub D. And then V wall is gonna kick back in. We're gonna get more resistance on that end. And so we're going to have a tension on this end and a compression on this end, OK? And so we can quantify that by first finding what V wall is and then uh, using that value to calculate, using that value and the diaphragm shear value to calculate what exactly the maximum collector force is. So just walking through that. V wall is going to be equal to what? V wall is going to be equal to that load F sub P, 10 kips, divided by 2, and then divided by 100 foot of wall on either side. So you see here we've got 100 foot of wall on, on either side of this. Okay, so we've got 10 kips. And we've going to divide that by 2 and then 100 foot and that's going to give us 50 PLF okay so we know what the shear in the wall is right and we know that 50 pounds per linear foot is resisted in the wall so like I said we're gonna starting out from the end here 50 pounds per linear foot is resisted by the wall so drawing that force out, we end up with a, a load uh, with one sign, if you will. The sign is going to be obviously opposite to the uh, V sub D because it's acting in the opposite direction. And then we got no wall in the middle where the collector is. So the sign flips to where we're going to have a compression in the collector. And then that comes back down to zero where we have the wall resisting V sub D. Okay. And so if we want to calc that this value over here, the value of interest, the tension, or the compression in this situation, since the walls are equal length, 50 feet, 50 feet, they're going to be the same value equal but opposite. Okay. We can quantify that by taking our 31.25 pounds per linear foot of shear along the diaphragm are 50 pounds per linear foot that are resisting resisted at the wall. Taking the difference of those two, which get, ends up giving us 18.75 pounds per linear foot, that's going to be the net force in this section over here, the net force in that section over there, 
and multiplying it by the length, and that's going to give us that peak. And just to show that to you here, so that's going to be P collector. And we're going to go 50 foot times V wall. V wall is 50 pounds per linear foot minus V sub D, which is diaphragm, 31.25 pounds per linear foot. Okay. And so that's going to give us what? 937.5 pounds or 0 0.94 kips because we like to present uh, load in terms of kips, right? Um, so there's one thing that we're missing. And what's that again? It's the omega force, right? So just going back to the same way we calculated the chord force, we are missing the omega force from this collector calculation. So backing up, I'm going to erase that. I'm going to multiply that. By 2.5, make it clear that this is the omega. And coming back down, it's going to be that 0.94, and we're going to multiply that by that 2.5. And so we're we're looking at roughly about 2.3 kips. Okay, and that's going to be the collector force, right? So just walking through that once again. Uh, we have a diaphragm force. The diaphragm force, uh, and along with the dimensions of the diaphragm in a flexible diaphragm, allows us to calculate the maximum chord force. Okay. It also allows us to calculate the diaphragm shear. That's the shear that is along the diaphragm, the shear that's transferred into the lateral force resisting system element, in this case, the special reinforced concrete shear walls. And then we find the collector force. Again, the collector is an element that collects that shear load. It brings it back to the lateral force resisting system. Okay, the lateral force resisting system in this situation is going to be the special reinforced concrete shear walls. And so that's resisting all of the shear load on that side. And using the, uh, uh, the shear, the resisting shear, V sub wall, and using the diaphragm shear, V sub D, we're able to calculate the net force along that wall line and then quantify what exactly the force is in the collector. And we can see in this situation that the maximum force occurs at the start and end of the collector, but the signs are opposite. Now just be aware that depending on what the length of wall is in this situation, the signs are, the values are equal, but they are opposite. But surely if you had a wall uh, on one end that was 10 foot, and on the other end uh, was 50 foot. Of course, you can imagine that on the end where it's 50 foot, you're going to see a much uh, larger, more substantial amount of load, as would make sense, because obviously more load is going to go back to the stiffer element, which is going to be the longer shear wall. OK, so uh, this example is going to be on uh, my website www.structural.wiki. Uh, it's going to be there with the solution as I have it, as I show it here. And it's also going to be there as a blank problem. And then you can fill in the blanks uh, to kind of give you some practice there. OK. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching these videos. And feel free to uh, check out my site and my email is on there, feel free to shoot me a message or feel free to send me a message here on YouTube. And uh, if you have any specific questions, I'm happy to help. Thanks so much. Have a great day.